Uh, folks, Docs, this afternoon. Thanks for coming on in. Uh, so I'm going to be talking. My name is Luke Jenkins. Day job is Wi-Fi engineer up at Weaver State. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the network and how we uh, we kept you guys all happy. Which I didn't hear any complaints. Uh, how was the network? Anybody? Good, good. All right. I, I think Syncom last year was pretty good. Cisco Live, the last couple of years, yes. A few years further back than that. Uh, yeah, they're doing good these days, though. I do my transition. Oh, because that was on my last slide. Look at that. I am a pro. Okay. So gear. Uh, the AP is up on the screen. They're up on uh, everywhere, up on those poles. We're Cisco 3702s with the halo or hyperlocation module and antenna. Uh, the extra ring around the outside, 32 directional antennas that do angle of arrival. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, 5 Cisco 3650, catalyst switches, nothing too special, just PoE plus uh, for that 30 watts of goodness. PF sense gateway, we were going to use a, an ASA from Cisco, uh, DSP pool size issue, so we just ended up going open source. Comcast Business was kind enough to donate a one gigabit per second circuit to the conference. And then, yes, thank you, thank you. Yay, Comcast Business. I don't know if they're still here, but thanks, guys. You are. And then these awesome uh, $7 per, per mount mounts, which was previously the next slide, but these guys that uh, we threw together. Uh, so the tools we used, Echo House Site Survey, to do a predictive design. We had the floor maps from the, the venue, drew simulated walls, and Group the network that way. And that was more for determining which radios, which 2.4 gigahertz uh, radios we left on. Uh, we had 40 of the APs, and we had about 9 or 10 that had 2.4 gigahertz radios turned on. So here in the ballroom, we have three, one on one, one on six, one on 11. Uh, and it was similar throughout the venue uh, because there are 22 non-overlapping channels we can use on 5 gigahertz, but there's only three non-overlapping channels on 2.4. Also used the Netscout AirCheck V2, and then Wi-Fi Explorer Pro that I'm actually going to show you real quick. And live demos, these always go great, right? And that is quite the A chart. But uh, here you see a whole bunch of, let's sort by DSSID. The UVCC ballroom ABC lobby, uh, and this right. The uh, they had on their 2.4 gigahertz radios uh, all of the data rates turned on, which is never good. Right there. So they have one, two, five, five. 6, 9, 11, 12, 18. So I would be in this as a Wi-Fi engineer if I didn't preach to you the gospel of turning off the low data rates. So anybody who is involved with networking all, please go home, check and look, make sure you've got your old classic B data rates turned off. Unless you have some barcode scanner or insulin pump, you got to support. So. Uh, but they, UVCC network is great for your smaller non-tech shows. Uh, you can hear learn about sewing machines. You, you just need some, uh, some spare Wi-Fi. But uh, bring in 700 uh, security and IT professionals, each with a few devices, and expectations are a bit higher. So we brought in the gear. Uh, UVCC was kind enough to let us utilize their fiber and copper plants and their closets, which really made this all work. And we added a network on top of it. I'll picture the bracket there. And then here are the, uh, the guys in action, in case you're not sitting right under one a little bit extra RF there. Uh, and these were based loosely on the design from Cisco Live, as Josh said. They've stepped up their game in the last four or five years. And the ideas from them, uh, we had to modify it a bit to get the halos to the horizontal position they need to be in to function. But it's worked pretty good. And then the uh, poles and the, that's just pipe and drape pipes from the venue. They were kind enough to let us use those. So the, the hyperlocation antennas give us awesome pictures like these. Uh, so you'll recognize 
On your right is second floor. Those are the three ballrooms this morning when I was taking some screenshots. You can see track one wasn't quite as, as uh, happening as tracks two and three. And then you can see up on the fourth floor, uh, still, still action around uh, out in the lobby there. And track four is going good. And lots of people in the hardware hacking village. So it was, it was really useful for us to have these stats throughout the, the conference to be able to keep an eye on, huh, that track's not doing quite so hot. Let's, let's go see what it is and see what we can do to help them out. So this is what the week looked like. You can see we got uh, about uh, 850, 860 clients for peak yesterday, right before lunch. And then we had some people uh, have a good lunch and not come back. Uh, but the other was badges being built and people slowly getting onto the network. So we, in total, unique devices connected to the network throughout the week, 1,632 devices. So that uh, for 700 attendees, you know, it's pretty pretty good take rate. And uh, 471 of them were Expressif chips, which is the brand of the module on the Badger Engineer. So thank you, uh, Cisco, for lending us all the gear. We did quick math, did math, and it was uh, over $200,000 of gear that they lent us, um, let us use as part of their sponsorship. So thank you, Cisco. Also included in that was uh, technical expertise and uh, software. So Comcast Business, which we just thanked, the conference committee uh, for having some faith in letting me, this is my first time away from the day job doing conference network, uh, leading it up. Um, UVCC staff, as I said, they were awesome to work with. And then Jonathan, Tristan, Clint, Mark, John, Jake, Dan, Connor, folks who helped me out and our volunteers who are going to be helping us tear down this afternoon. So thank you very much. And uh, up next, we've got Jonathan and Clint to talk more about the badge. So come on up, guys. Can we get some oomphs, oomphs, oomphs to get them up on stage? Nah, just, you know, good, good transition. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. All right, so the badge. There's the link that's been in the Hardware Hacking Village. And uh, later we'll post the other link for the code uh, a little bit later once we looked at it. But um, So last year's badge, for those who remember, it was pre-built. Had awesome 8-bit graphics and maps on there, courtesy of Clint and, and Dustin and folks. And uh, it was a power monster, and nobody's really ran very long, right? And then uh, it was based on Lua and the code for the two different processes on there. So when uh, proposals were happening for this year's badge, there was talk of, okay, maybe we don't do a badge. And um, there were some proposals out there. And someone proposed something like this with Kelly's name on it. And uh, that didn't go over too well. But there's, it had changeable screens, just like the other one. So we thought it was okay. But I guess, guess that didn't go over. Yep, there we go. So as you can see, that was really just a modified last year's badge. But so this year's badge, based on the same Wi-Fi chip as last year, and then we added uh, some tweaks to work with the Mac 7219 chip that's in the center that runs your LEDs. The Hackers Challenge game score was sent with an MQTP message broker server, just like uh, last year's information. So this year we were one piece of information. It's also how we did the uh, countdown to the Hackers Challenge, which was a last minute modification to the source code and pushed out to your badges. Um, the brightness is adjusted based on location data from those APs and the CMX and things that Luke kind of mentioned. Um, and then, yeah, the seven, seven, seven segments displays are even more retro than the old ones. Um, so design goal number one was more power. So this, this is a high voltage power line on our campus at the day job. And it looks like that inside and 
like four inches big, five inches big, and bigger battery. So you know, kind of SLA battery there. This was uh, one of the first prototypes we sent to uh, Seth so he could test and make sure that the MQTT stuff was going to work for him, and he loved it. And uh, so we tried sourcing all the parts from, well, most of the parts from China to try to help. And the D1 minis that you use on here that you had to flash at the flashing stations, those only come from China. And so when I got it, if you've ever ordered anything from AliExpress or Banggood or someplace like that, you know that if it starts out as a cardboard box, it ends up being a cardboard bag by the time you get it to your door. So that's what the box of, of uh, D1 minis looked like. And when I went to pick it up, it felt like one of those uh, manila envelopes instead. But it was completely taped with packing tape everywhere. And uh, that, that's a picture of all the stuff inside, just showing that it really came. So the D1 Mini, or the Max 71219 chip on the front, it uh, has a font that can display four uh, characters, four, sorry, four letters, and uh, in addition to the numbers, and that is helped backwards because those dev chips that you, or the dev board we saw earlier was also from China and the whole right to left, left to right differences in the languages, I'm assuming, they had wired their Mac chip up, digit one, on the opposite side of our, of what would normally think, we would think. So our test code, I put it on here and I'm like, man, why did Clint spell P-L-E-H? -E I, I couldn't figure it out. I started Googling a little bit. And then one day I walked back in with it on like this and I was like, oh, right, help, backwards. <laughs> so. Because I remembered back three or four months before when I created the badge board that I was going to wire it correctly so it would be easier to do the loops and everything. But, so, did you get using the way? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. So this is just some, when we were first writing the code, um, when it would reboot, it would start throwing random characters on the screen every time it would reboot. So it was saying a number and then it would slowly just degrade. <laughs> and so we figured out it was part of the sleep um, commands that were causing this to happen. But essentially. So as I said, tried to source all the parts from China. These Max 72, uh, 7219 chips are about $5 a pop uh, when bought from Mauser. And uh, there was places on AliExpress that sold them for $1.25. And our, our first uh, test batches were from there just to get our boards going. So I ordered up the 600 and uh, I'm like, okay, where are they? They show they're in uh, LA or wherever, whatever port they came in. And a couple days later, I got a letter in the mail that said U.S. Customs Border Protection on it. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, you have to pay tariffs or taxes, right? That's fine. So I open it up and it says, oh, provide a trademark uh, release. And I'm like, oh, what do you think about that part? So, well, the seller's supposed to provide that, right? Seller wouldn't provide it. So we ended up having to source them from. Uh, uh, Mauser and get a refund from the seller. So I don't know if they ever made it back to the seller, but who knows. So then the other part we ordered from uh, all the little discrete parts that you had in all your mini bags. You know, that took us forever to pack all those up. Not really. We we ordered those from uh, Kata Electronics, uh, which they sell a lot of stuff on eBay and things. You can also just buy directly from their store. If you need any little parts, it's great to go there. There's a $5 minimum order. but they, I asked them if they would package all the parts because when you order parts from them, they come in all the individual bags, kind of like this. They keep all of your resistors together, unlike they did here. But uh, as I was ordering, I said, hey, we need 615 packages that look like this, and that's how you got your little bag of stuff. And uh, they said, well, okay, ha what's your budget? And I said, no, no, just give me a quote. And we went back and forth, and we, we got it worked out. And then they asked me at one point, do you, how do you want the extra pieces packaged? Because we ordered extras, because as you guys know, not everybody puts their diode in correctly, or including some of us sometimes. So we ordered extras, and I said, yeah, just package those how you would. Well, I open up the bag, or the box, when I first got it, and I pull it out, and I'm like, oh, man, did they pack all these individually and put them not in 615 kits? Because this was the first bag on top. As you maybe can see there, that's just a whole bunch of diodes in one bag. And it scared me for a second there, but then I looked below and found they had the bags that you guys were provided. So, and I thought, okay, well, for 60 bucks, package all those, that's pretty good. Uh, and then I had to order all of the uh, seven segment displays. I was hoping to get all one color to make it easy, but in the end, SparkFun did not have enough reds 
forced to buy, so I went to the next color. That still didn't fulfill our order, so I went to the next color. And the very last colors were the white and the blue, because we didn't want to get too many blues around here. But uh, unfortunately, we had to get uh, a few of them. But it gave some diversity to everything and gave you guys choice, so it was fun. Um, and then uh, you guys all had fun hacking the badge, because you all came in and did stuff. And various people have done lots of fun things with it. Um, I guess any questions? That one was kind of anything. No questions, not that I can see anybody. And uh, thanks to the guys at the Hardware Hacking Village for helping everyone build the badges. Yeah. Great. Alan. Alan. <laughs> yep. Okay.